church. How are we doing this morning? We good? Oh, that's great. Great to hear that from you guys. Um, I'm good today. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I feel, I feel great. I feel fantastic. Lindsay cares. Thank you, sir. Um, as Mark said, you know, it's, it's the, that time of year again. Every year we do this. This is a, a generosity campaign that, that we do every year. It's called Be Rich. And what it is, is it's our opportunity to go out and, and to be rich as a church. And we'll do that through three ways. We're going to love, uh, we're going to give, we're going to serve. And, and today we get, you know, we're going to be talking about give. So give, serve, love. But you guys are going to have an opportunity every week to respond. And last year we did this and we saw amazing things come out of it. And this is something even that's happening sort of globally right now. Churches all over the world are doing the same campaign right now called Be Rich. So as you guys are giving, churches all over the world are giving. As you're serving, they're serving. As you're loving, they're doing those same things there. So it's a special thing that we get to be a part of. It's not just us. It, it's 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 the church coming together to show the world that the church can make a difference, and we do that because we're rich. We're, we're rich in what we have, and then we get a chance to share that with others. So like I said, today we're talking about uh, the giving aspect of Be Rich. So we get to talk about money, which is a, a great thing that a lot of people love to talk about. Uh, if you're new here and this is your first time, uh, it just so happens to be lucky for you that this is the Sunday that we talk about money. But I promise th this isn't just about getting money from you so you can relax and kind of take it easy. But uh, I want to start off asking a question. If you love spending money, can I just have a show of hands out there? Yeah, yeah. Some people don't love spending money. Uh, some people love to save money and, they, and that sort of thing. That's not me. That's not me at all. I love spending money. If I could, I would just make that, yeah, I could spend all the money that we have. Uh, I don't because that would make me a bad steward of what God's given me and because then we would be poor and we wouldn't be able to have cars or, or get here or, or any of those things. But I could easily spend a ton of money. And, and in fact, I'm not even allowed to go to the grocery store. And I've said this before, but I'm not allowed to go to Woolworths. I, I don't do the grocery shopping for our family. Because if I did, we would have no money at the end of the month and we would have a whole bunch of food and stuff that we don't need to have. If I won the lottery, again, I've said this before, this has not changed, my heart is steadfast, my heart will not change, it stays steady in this. If I win the lottery, the first thing I'm doing is I'm going to Woolworths. <laughs> and I'm going grocery shopping. I'm gonna buy every granola and cereal and cookie and biscuit and you know thing that they have in there. I can easily drop, I could drop a lot of money in there. So, but, but we, a lot of us love to spend money. A, lot, a few of us are afraid to spend money. And it got me thinking as I was thinking about, okay, if we're gonna talk about giving, we're gonna talk about money. I thought, why is it that we actually spend money? What is it, and, and if you're a fundraiser out there, or if you're listening online and you raise funds, this is a great question to ask. What is it that inspires somebody to spend money? You know, if you're raising funds or if we're raising a tithe here at the church, how do I get you to part with your finances? Well, it's not just fundraisers or churches that do this. Brands do this. Grocery stores do this. Um, you know, when you go to the mall, everyone is competing for your money. Everyone's trying to get you to spend your money. So why do we do that? What is it in us that causes us that, to actually flip the switch and say, yes, I'm going to spend that money. And some of us have a really easy switch to flip. That's mine. It's pretty much permanently broken. I'm ready to spend at any given time. But some of you have a really, really hard switch to flip. But there's something in you that causes you to do that. Now, I've got four categories of why we spend money. Actually, it's five. And I'll call these motivations. I have five motivators for what causes us to spend money. The first one is, and you can identify with all these. The first one is this. Sometimes, sometimes you have to give your money. So you get pulled over, you get a ticket. You don't have a choice. You, you, you have to pay that ticket. You've got to give money to that. There's no choice there. There's no option. Uh, you get fined. You've got to cover that fine. These are situations where you, you just, you have to do it. You have to pay your rent. You have to to give money. No choice, but you have to do it. Uh, another motivating factor is sometimes 
not only do we have to give money, sometimes you're forced to give your money. Now, I've got a bad example when it comes to this here, but I'll use it anyway because it works the best for the sermon that I'm preaching today. So that's the one that we're going to go with. Let's say you are, um, again, b- bad example, but let's say you're robbed at an ATM. You're, f- you're forced to give your money up at the ATM. You don't have a choice. Someone or something is forcing you to do that. Another example that I thought about was like culturally, I, I know a lot of families that things happen, you know, there's a funeral or somebody passes away and the whole family looks around and they say, ah, this relative is the one with the money. They, and then they go to them, hey, you've got to pay for the funeral. You've got to pay for this. You have to give for these things. You're almost like forced to do that in order to stay part of, of the family. So there's things that you, ha- you just have to do. You just have to pay your taxes. You just have to pay your fines and your tickets. And there's things that you're forced to do, like if, if you're robbed, you've got to give that money up you know, to the person that's robbing you. And then sometimes, a, a third one is sometimes it's just simply necessary for you to spend your money. And th- this is something like, you know, if I want airtime, I've got to spend money to get that. If I want data on my phone, I've got to spend money in order to get that. If I'm watching uh, the South Africa game today. Did they play today? Is that correct? See, I've been so deep in sermon preparation. I don't know what's going on out the outside in the world there. No, I'm kidding. So I, I watched New Zealand and Italy play and just mourned, you know, like that was, that was, that was, that was a bad one. But if you're watching rugby and you, and you want to make sure that in the middle of that game, that the game stays on, then you're gonna make sure that you've got electricity on the meter. You know, in my house, I always forget to uh, make sure that there's electricity on the meter. And so the power goes off. And, uh, and when it goes off, everyone looks at their watch because if it's like uh, at an even time, like 10 o'clock or eight o'clock or whatever, then we know that it's load shedding. But if it's some other time, then we know that dad's just not put electricity on the meter yet. And so if you, if you want, to watch the game, it's necessary that you spend money on electricity. Now, the fourth category, the fourth motivation that I have is sometimes that you're willing to spend your own money. You know, this is who likes to buy like nice things for themselves? Who likes to look sharp in here? Yeah, we've got some people in here. You know, it's you're, you're like, I'm willing to spend my own money on certain things. For me, it's not so much clothes. It's, it's things like a pocket knife or I'm into fountain pens, you know, like a fountain pen or something. I'm willing to spend money on something like that. I'll wear a pair of shoes until my feet come through the bottom, but a brand new pen or a really cool like pocket knife or something, yeah, I'm gonna spend, I'm willing to spend money on that there. But we've all got things that we're willing to spend our own money on. And then the, the fifth motivation that I have is this is where your heart is moved, where you've got kind of like a tug of the heart. And, and this is like a gift or a donation or even like, you know, a tithe here at the church. But you've, you're, you're gifting money. You're donating money to something. Something's tugged on your heart. So th- those are five motivations, kind of five motivations for why we spend our money. Now, in each of those motivations, if you kind of look at them as a whole, you can actually see that there's a pattern that runs across these five motivations. And it's a simple pattern. And I thought this was really interesting as I was picking this apart and thinking about this idea of, okay, this pattern, it goes like this. There's you, you are a person, you're on this side here. And then there's, there's you on the other side, and there's a, a transformation that needs to happen. And I'm gonna give you guys some examples. So you, like for example, you have a ticket and you want to be Chris without a ticket. You need to transform from Chris with ticket to Chris without a ticket. So that a transformation happens in each one of these areas, but that transformation happens through a transaction. So transactions facilitate a transformation. Now here's what that means. If you're lost, it's fine. I was lost when I wrote this thing. I spent a lot of time trying to think, how do I unlose people? You know, how do I unlose myself in this? Is that transactions, the best way to do a transaction is money. So a transaction would be you go to the petrol station to buy a Coke Zero because you're hopelessly addicted to them. You take money in there, you give them money, they give you a Coke Zero, you have now made a transaction. So those five motivations, those five motivations where you spend money, you are, you are, 
facilitating, you're doing a transaction when you spend your money. And as you do a transaction, there is a transformation that is taking place. So I'll give you an example for all of them here. So the first one that we talked about again was, was like society says you must. I'm Chris with the ticket and I wanna become Chris without a parking ticket. So I go and I transact with my money and I pay the parking ticket. Then now because I've made that transaction, I have transformed from Chris with a ticket to Chris without a ticket. If you're forced to give your money, if you're being robbed, you want to be unrobbed. So the transaction that you make is here you go criminal, here is my money and my debit card. And then you hit the fetal position, you lay in the floor and I would give you the advice, just scream, just scream as loud as you can. You lay there, you scream and you have now transformed from person being robbed to person that's not being robbed because you've transacted, you've given your money. Yeah, I heard a comedian one time, you, you know what you should, <laughs> You know, the best way, let's say someone's breaking into your house, and this is a different kind of joke in America because it's not as common, I, I think, as it is here, but you know the best way to get rid of somebody that's broken into your house? You take off all your clothes and run screaming at them. <laughs> You'll freak them out. They'll freak out and they'll think, what, have I, what house have I broken into? What have I done here? Just take everything off and just run screaming, you know, as fast as you can at them. So, simply necessary, things that are simply necessary, like electricity to watch the game. You wanna, you, you, there's you before you've bought electricity, and then now there's you with electricity so you can watch the game. There is a transaction that has been made to ensure that the game will stay on in your home. That transaction is money, and that transaction has given the transformation of now I have electricity in my home. You're willing to give your money to something. There's you, and now there's you with the new outfit that you want. What do you have to do to transform from you to you with the new outfit? You've got to transact, you've got to give money. Now you transform from person without outfit to now person with brand new outfit. Or in my case, person without a cool pocket knife to now person with a cool pocket knife. The last one is, is a gift or a donation. Yeah, and this is a special one, especially in the next area, we'll talk about this a, a little bit more. But the, the transformation that you're doing there is, is maybe you wanna see someone else transform. You wanna see the person at the robot transform or, or you wanna see the, the organization that you're donating money to transform or, or you wanna see you know, the church that you go to, you wanna see them transform. So you make a transaction, you give of your finances and you see them go from where they are to where they would like to go, a transformation happens. So not, does that make sense? Are we all still here? Yeah. So it's, it's, not, it's not complicated. And, and I actually think it's, you know, it's quite simple here because not only does do these five motivations show that there, there's a pattern and that pattern involves like a transformation, but, but it also shows us something else. And, and it, it speaks to more of like a heart issue that's, that's in us. And, and, it, and in fact, so, there's five motivations for spending money. And, and I'm sure that you can think of more, but in general, there's five motivations. I didn't say the word reasons because there's, there's five motivations, but I think that there's only one reason that we spend money. Everything that you spend, I believe, can be traced back to this one reason. And it's because you find value. You, you only spend money where you see value. You don't spend money on something that you don't see any value in. And I'm gonna go through and give you examples for all this, but this is so true that I can say this with, with pretty good confidence that if, if you follow your money, then you will find your values. So if you follow your money, look at your bank account, then you'll find what your values are. So again, let me walk you guys through these same examples. Okay, when you have to give, when you have to give your money here, and Karina's gonna put those up on the screen for you. The first one, when you have to give your money, your value is being a person that doesn't carry a ticket because you value safety and you don't wanna get pulled over at, at a roadblock and possibly have your car, your license or something taken from you. So yes, you have to pay that ticket, but you pay the ticket because you value not going to jail or you value your own safety, you value the security of knowing 
that you don't have something hidden on your record that could get you in trouble later. Another one, when you're forced to give, you value your life. And so therefore you give up your money, you give up your finances if you're being robbed. You value that. Or if your family's pressuring you to pay for something, then you, you, at the end of the day, you give up, you pay for it because you value the, the cultural rules or laws or whatever that sort of guides you or guides your family. That's your value there. When it's necessary to give, you value Netflix. You value the game on TV. You value having electricity. You value having something gas so that you can cook on your stove. You value the food that's in your pantry. All these things, you value those things. And because you value those things, then you spend money on them. They're just necessary things that you need to spend money on. But if, if you don't value electricity, you can live by candlelight. It's not that you have to buy electricity, but you value the benefit of electricity, so therefore you pay for it. It's value-based. When, when you're willing to spend your money, you're willing to give of your finances, you value the way that you are going to feel or look when you have that new outfit on. You value that. If you're willing to spend money on your kids, you value the way that they feel when they receive a gift or the way that they feel when they receive whatever it is that, that you've purchased for them, but you have a value for that. And then the last one, when you donate or you give a gift when your heart is moved, and, and, and this is one that goes even maybe a little bit deeper here. Yes, you, value, you may value giving, but really here's what it is. There's something in your life that you value so much that you want them to have access to that thing. You know, it, it, that's why if you see a homeless person and they're wearing rags and they've got plastic bags on their feet, you may say, man, I, I want them to have a warm coat. I want them to have shoes. I want them to have clothing because I value that in my life. So I want them to have access to the thing that I value. I mean, who knows, that person may hate clothing they, they may have purposely sold all their clothes and worn plastic bags because they don't value clothing at all. And I'm not saying don't help people out here. I'm just trying to open up your mind to this idea that really the thing that motivates you to give, even the thing that motivates you to give to organizations or to nonprofits or things like that, is there's a value in you that causes you to do that. So our, our giving or our spending, there's lots of motivating factors for it. But I believe that there's really only one reason that we give, and it's because there's a value there. And, and I spent a lot of time, even in myself, trying to debunk this. Like, well, what if I give to this, or what if I give you know, to that? And at the end of the day, that there's always something that, that I found in myself that was, that was a value, you know, that was some kind of value. Even thinking about, well, what about people that just drive around and like throw money out of the window? Well, there's a reason that they do that. And there's something in them that they, they value that causes them to do that. I can't think of a reason that someone would spend money on something that has no value. The, the only thing I could think of is if you were held hostage and tied up and someone you know, took the money from you and you don't have the choice to let them or not let them. So, except for the fact that there's maybe some extreme situations on either end, for the most part, we spend our money, we give to things based on a value. And we can find those values by following our finances. And when we follow our finances and we identify our values, it tells us something very important about our heart. And, and this is really important to Jesus as well. And, and this is where I'm gonna bring some scripture into this for us, is Jesus spoke about money more than he spoke about heaven. Jesus spoke about money all through the New Testament. He wasn't shy to bring it up. He wasn't shy to speak about it. And, and oftentimes Jesus would tell parables. He would tell these, these stories, these references to things that involved money because everyone understood the value of finances and money and everyone could understand and relate to what Jesus was saying when he used money as teaching. You know, and there's also something really important to this idea, follow, follow the finances, discover your value. And when you discover your values, you discover something about your heart. And what is the thing that Jesus wants more than anything? He wants your heart. What is the thing that Jesus wants to be in you? Jesus wants to be the thing that you value the most. So if you value Jesus the most, 
and you follow your finances, does it point to Jesus or does it point somewhere to something else? Now, in order to say that, yeah, my finances point to Jesus, I'm not saying that 90% of your money should go to Jesus or church or something like that, but, but definitely 10%, definitely your, your, your tithe. And, and then maybe something else that, that maybe Jesus lays something on your heart, God lays something on your heart. But, but if you follow your finances, you find your values, your values expose your heart. Your heart is the thing that Jesus wants the most. And Jesus tells us this parable that we're going to look at today, and it's in Matthew 25, and it's verses 14 through 30. And, and this is called the parable of talents. And if you're reading in the New Testament, which we're going to read from today, it, it's called the, you know, the parable of the bags of gold. And Jesus has got a crowd around him, and he's been teaching all day. He's been teaching for a couple days, actually. And he's been working people through these parables. And a parable is just a, a story that Jesus is telling to teach a lesson. And it, it gets people thinking about things. And it, and it conveys sort of a, an emotion or, or a, a thought that he wants people to grasp onto and, and to understand. And Jesus was such a good teacher that he just put things into context in a way that everyone could wrap their head around. And, and that's what I tried to do in the very beginning of this by talking about these five motivations. So we're going to read this, this story. We're going to read all of it. It's, it's a few verses here, but it's, it, it's an entertaining one. It's a good one. And here's what I want you to do while we look at this scripture here. They're going to have it on the screen, and I'm going to read from my, from my Bible. I want you to pretend that, that you're in uh, the presence of Jesus, and I'm not. Don't pretend that I'm Jesus. Just <laughs> We'll get in major trouble that way. I want you to pretend that you're seated or you're standing and that there's this guy that they call the Messiah who's going to teach you something. He's been teaching all day long. And people are telling you that this guy, Jesus, that he teaches some really good stuff. And actually, he's even done a few miracles. And so people are starting to say, okay, well, maybe based on the miracles that he's done, some of the things that he's teaching, maybe we should really pay attention to these things. Because there, there is some credibility and some validity to what it is that he's saying. So I, I kind of want to hear what he's saying. I kind of want to listen to what he's saying. In fact, I've showed up today because I hear that this Jesus guy is going to be here. And I think he's going to say something that, that maybe will change my life or help my life. Because, I mean, I've even heard that if people just even touch his cloak, that they'll be healed from it. And so, and so that's you. You're here because you want to be here. You're eager for it. You want to hear what Jesus has got to say. And so Jesus is standing there, and he's, he's got you all around. And... He says, I, I need to teach you about your heart. I need to teach you a lesson about finances, about stewardship, about all these things. And so he, he says, let me, let me tell you this story here. And so in chapter 25 of Matthew, verses 14, and I'll try and stay out of the way so that people can see the screen here. Jesus says, again, he starts off with again, because this is not the first parable that he's told this day. So he says, again, it, it's going to be like a man going on a journey. So this is not a Bible verse. I mean, it's a verse in the Bible. This is Jesus telling you a story. And so he says, hey, guys, this will be like a man going on a journey. And then he calls his servants, and he entrusted his wealth to his servants. Now, this is something that's very typical. Everyone in the crowd would automatically be identifying with this. This idea of master and servant or master and slave, this was a normal cultural thing here. And it's not slave in the way that we think of slavery, but it's, it's, it's master-slave. And this happened all the time. If a master left, he would call his servants together and he would delegate some things to them. So he does that. Again, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them, gives them all of his wealth. Then to one... So to, to his favorite, he gave five bags of gold. To another, he gave two bags of gold. And then to another one, he gave one bag, each according to his ability. So he's assessed his three workers. And he's been like, this one is worthy of three. This one's worthy of two. This one's still unsure of. He may not have a job. He's still on his three-month probation period. I'm just going to give him one and see what happens with him there. Then he goes on, the man who had received five bags of gold, 
He went at once and he put his money to work and he gained five bags more. Great job. So also the one who gained two bags of gold, he, he went out and he gained two more. But, verse 18, but the man who received one bag, he went off. This is so funny. And I understand why he did this, but he goes off and he dug a hole. You know, um, I would have put it on a shelf, hidden it behind a rock, uh, put it in a jar. You know, I could see this guy like a, uh, like our, our dog Craven. He's a mutt. He's just, he's up for sale. If anyone would like him, he digs holes and he just gets, just, just digs a hole. That's what I think about when I see this guy and sitting in the house, I yell, Craven, I yell his name and he looks up like, you know, looking for where I am. And if he doesn't see me, he just keeps digging a hole. That's what I think of when I hear this guy, you know, he, he goes off and he, he dug a hole. Man receives one bag of money, digs a hole in the ground, hides his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants, he returns and he returns to settle accounts with them. So he says, guys, tell me what happened with the finances. Let's talk about what happened with you here. And so then in verse 20, the man who had received five bags of gold, he brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. This is like that person in school that always did their homework. You know, see, I was, I was the guy that dug the hole and put the money in it. Then there were people in class, they always do their homework. They get perfect marks on everything. That's your five bag person there. Don't we all just love that person? No, yeah. The master loves him. So the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things and I will put you in charge of many things. So come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man with the two bags of gold, he's learning to become an overachiever. He comes and he says, master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more bags. His master replies, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. And I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. See, Matthew wrote this story here. And what Matthew's letting us know is that the person with five bags and the person with two bags, they get the same reward. If, you know, if Matthew were typing this on a computer, he'd be like, well, this is easy. Select, command C, copy, put your cursor down, command V, paste, because it's the same thing. Just copy and paste the same answer. So the master is not really concerned with how much he got in return. The master is just concerned with what the person did with their finances. That's what he cares about. The reward is the same. You get to share in the master's happiness there. So then in verse 24, the man who had received one bag of gold, he comes and he says, Master, ah, oh, it's so good to see you here. You're back so early. Thought you would be gone longer. Um, it's rained a little bit, so I know this is muddy. Get it? Because he dug a hole, put the money in a, in a hole. You guys are sleeping. So the man who had received one bag of gold said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man. You harvest where you have not sown, and you gather where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out, and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. And it's probably, that's where, I, that's where the mud joke comes in. So here's this muddy bag of gold. His master replies to him. So this guy says, well, you're kind of like a jerk. So I'm afraid that you'll get mad at me. So I put the money in the ground. And the master says, well, I've got an answer for being a jerk. Here's what you could have, if you really think that I'm a hard person, then here's actually what you should have done. He says, let me answer what you should have done. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. Because he was, he was lazy. And here's why he was lazy. You knew that I harvest where I have not sown and I gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have at least received it back with interest. I don't know that there's a correlation to this, but harvest where you haven't sown and gather where you haven't planted seed. I guess that's kind of like drawing interest in a bank account. Because you put your money in, but other people's money is also in there. And that's impacting the interest rate. So you're gaining interest on that. So the master is basically saying, like, you, you know that I kind of want to get more out of this than what I've poured into it. So you could have at least gone to the bank 
and put it with the banker, and then I would have returned. And again, the master is saying, it's not about what you give me back. It's about what you did with what I entrusted to you. So he calls him wicked, says all that stuff. And then in verse 28, he says, so take the bag of gold from him, from the person, from the, the hole digger, and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. See, this is the verse that we love to talk about. We talk about giving. If you have and you give more, then you'll have an abundant blessing over your life. That's not what we're going to talk about today. And then the master goes on to say in verse 29, for, he finishes off, whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And what he's talking about there when he says, forever who does not have, whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. I think that he's saying whoever does not have character, whoever doesn't have motivation, whoever doesn't have um, you know, a value system, just take from them and give it to the person that does have character, that does have a value system. And see, th this is the, the story that Jesus tells. When he tells this story, there's so many lessons that we can draw from this story. We can draw a lesson on stewardship. If you're given something, then you should steward it well. You shouldn't squander it. You know, people give so that we can uh, receive a paycheck here from South Point Church because you guys give a tithe. Now, if I take your tithe that has supplied me a paycheck and I go spend it at Woolworths every single month and I have nothing but uh, an assortment of muffins and 10 really cool pocket knives, that's not wise. That's a really dumb thing there. That's bad stewardship. And, and that's not what, what the master is teaching here. The master is teaching good stewardship. Take what you've been given, treat it well, and invest it. You know, that's a lesson that we draw from this. You know, we draw uh, lessons on leadership from this. We draw all kinds of lessons from this. But I, I've got a bit of a, of a different angle for us to look at here with this here. Because we're talking about value. We're talking about values. So what was the value of servant number one and servant number two? What, what was their value? Their value, I think, was that they valued the master. Because they valued the master, they knew what they needed to do to please the master. They, they didn't invest the money so that they could receive more money because remember, the master came back to settle the accounts, meaning he took back from them what he, had been, what he gave them plus what they made on it. He comes and he collects it, it's all his. So their value wasn't that they were gonna get rich from this. They valued the master. Because they valued the master, that's where they transacted in order for there to be a transformation. They transformed five bags into 10. They transformed two bags into four. They did that through a transaction. It led to transformation. Transformation happens because we see a value in something. The value takes us to where our heart is. So because they valued the master, they probably had respect for the master. They had respect for what he was giving them. They showed loyalty. They had integrity. They had a good work ethic. They had all of these things. I believe that was their value. So what about servant number three? What was the value of servant number three? I feel like it was self. The value was self, self-preservation. This guy valued himself more than he valued anybody else or anything else. And it wasn't that he valued his safety because he could have put the money into a bank. He could have put it there and gained interest on it. But he didn't. In fact, a bank would have been safer than a hole in the ground. So it wasn't that he valued, he, he valued fear. He wasn't afraid of the master. He wasn't afraid for his own safety. He used that as an excuse because the master knew exactly what was wrong with him. You're wicked, meaning you're deceitful. You're deceitful and you're lazy. You're self-absorbed. It's all about you. The value is you. So we get to ask a question of who do we align with? Do we align with servant one and servant two where we value the master? Or just in general in your life, do you have a value system or a value set around good stewardship and all of those things? Do you value your source of funds? Do you, you know, what is your value there? Do you align yourself with servant one, servant two? 
Do you value God the master who's given you these finances, who's given you the money? Or do you align yourself with servant number three? Are you terrified and, and your value is self-preservation? And a lot of us have a good reason to be terrified and to, to, be, and to really be focused on self-preservation because a lot of us live in some really, really tough situations. And a lot of us are victims to some really, really bad people because there's sin in the world. And so I don't want you to feel condemned, not for a second, if your value is on yourself or on self-preservation, but ask yourself this question, it, do I value myself because I'm deceitful and I'm wicked and I'm prideful and because I love money and I have a love of money and I just want all of it? Do you align with, with that? So who do you align with? Servant one, two, or servant three? Now, that's normally where this ends, but... I want you to think about one more person. See, there's four people in the story. Servant one, servant two, servant three. That's one, two, three. We're teaching Benjamin how to count, so we always one, two, three. But there's a four. So th this is what I'm asking you today. Today, I'm asking that you be masters, not slaves. But I want you to be one like the master. Here's what that means for you. See, the master was the richest of them all. The, the master was the one that gave and he was the one that, that collected. But here's what's so great about the master in the story. It, it, the master doesn't represent, and in this story, what I'm asking you to think now doesn't necessarily represent Jesus. So I'm not asking you to be the God of your world or the Jesus of your world. But think about the reward of the master. The master gets to watch people walk in their giftings. The master got to bless three people and he was excited and he was pleasured when two of those people bettered themselves and did better with those finances that he gave. And yes, when you give of your finances and when you give gifts and you spend and you give donations, not all of them are gonna have a, have a return that comes back for them, but hey, two out of three is pretty good for this master. So it's, it's a mind shift. It's, it's, if, if I'm servant number one and servant number two, I'm receiving. And what am I going to do with what I'm receiving? And, and what is that going to reflect about my heart? If I'm servant number three, I'm receiving from the master. What am I going to do with that? And how does that reflect the value system of my heart? But if we change this around and we put our seat in the master's seat, then now we're in the position of I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm giving to you because I know that you're trustworthy and I'm giving you the five bags. I'm giving to you because I know that you're good and you're trustworthy and you're faithful. So I'm giving the two bags of gold to you. And even the third one, I know that you're wicked. I know that you're lazy, but I believe in you. I want to believe in you. And so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you one bag of gold and see what you do with it. What if you take yourself out of the seat of receiving and doing? And you put yourself in the master's seat where you're giving and you're watching. You're giving and you're watching what happens with what you give. And then when you come back and you settle your account, then you get to see the fruit that came from what you gave. Think about the master that returned from his journey. He settled his accounts. He left and he had given out 13 bags of gold. No, five, eight bags of gold. And then when he got back, that number had almost doubled. He received, from, he received a blessing from that. So in, in Be Rich, you know, today when we talk about Be Rich being about giving, today is, is give. This whole week you're going to have an opportunity to give. And today before you leave, you're going to get an opportunity to give. We've got snap scan codes. Uh, if, it, if they're obnoxiously everywhere, it's because I printed off 20 and I stuck them everywhere on the building so that when you walk out of here, you're just reminded, hey, have I given today? But, but we, we, we get a chance today to sow into as the masters, from the master's position. We get a chance to sow into the Red Cross Children's uh, Hospital. Last year, we funded a project. Uh, this year, we've given uh, more money to them uh, because when you tithe to us, we take 10% of that tithe and we give it away. We use it for South Point Cares. We help you guys, but we also, we give it out to people. We've been giving money to the Red Cross Children's Hospital, partly because we know that, that they're like the, the person that receives five bags. You give them five bags, they're going to turn it into 10, 15, 20, 25, 
they're trustworthy and they're good. And every single one of you can drive down there and take a look at what they're doing. And there's no question in our mind that that money is being used in a right and a good way. If you want to practice being in the master's seat, then today give like the master to the Red Cross Children's Trust. If you want to practice being in the master's seat regularly, then I tell you what, I would encourage you to give your tithe. Every month you get paid. The first 10% comes off of that. And you give South Point your 10% tithe. And then watch what God does in return on your life. Don't be afraid. Don't be servant number three. And yes, you are servant number one and two because God's given you finances. Now you're doing something with those finances, but put yourself in the master's seat and see what happens in your life. And so today at the end of this service, we're going to have a snap scan code that will be on the screen. And as you walk out, you'll walk past all my obnoxious little signs and you can snap scan there. Just put in the reference, be rich. Or you can log on, you can give uh, EFT, you can still give with an EFT, same place where you give your tithe, and just put in your reference there, be rich. You know, you, you can give cash. If you give cash, let them know at the info table, hey, th this is for, for, for be rich, because when this is done, we want to know how much we gave. Last year, we gave 45,000 Rand for this. I would love to, to double that. I, I would love for us to give, you know, 90,000 Rand this year and pay for a whole orthopedic wing there at, at Red Cross Children's Hospital. And we've got some signs out there that tell you what that goes to. So, so we've done the work of giving you the opportunity to sit in the master's seat. Now, all you have to do is accept it. Put yourself in that seat and see what happens in your life. Let your values be known. Follow the money to see what your value is. This is such an easy opportunity for you to sit in that seat and for you to give. So I'm, I'm going to pray over us now, and the band is going to come up. They're going to lead us in worship. And while they do, as always, we have our communion table in the back and a, and a prayer table on the other side where you can light a candle, you know, in memoriam of a prayer that you're praying for. These are not required. This is if you feel impressed by God to do that, you can go back and take communion or you can go back and light a candle. On the side here, we've got a prayer station by this light. If you need prayer for anything, we've got amazing people uh, over there for you to, to go and talk to and just get prayer with those people. But what my prayer is, is that, is that you take this story that we've heard so many times about the talents of being servant one, servant two, servant three. We've spent so much of our lives being taught to be servant one and servant two. Well, what if today you open up your heart and say, God, let me know what it's like to sit in the master's seat. What, what does that do for, my, for me, for my finances, for my value system? So let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that you are God. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you give us opportunities to sit in the master's seat, that you just bless us, you've You've given us finances. You've taken such good care of us. Every single one of us in here is blessed. Lord, I pray for every heart in here that you would move. I pray that everybody in here would be moved to support not only the Red Cross Children's Hospital, but they would be moved to just see what it's like to sit in the master's chair and to give from that perspective. So, Father, open their eyes, open their hearts, open their minds, open their ears to hear you, open their eyes to see the vision of how life is different when you walk around with the master's mentality of I'm gonna give, I'm gonna bless, I'm gonna sow, I'm gonna call up, I'm gonna equip, I'm gonna enable. And just let people get a glimpse of how that changes lives. So Jesus, we love you. And we thank you for all that you've done in our lives. And Father, we worship you in your name, Jesus, amen. You can stand and worship with us.